she's got camera on camera right there. Yeah. So hello everyone and uh, welcome to the Center for Health Informatics. Today, um, or I'm Kathy Eastwood and I'm the Associate Director of Research and Strategic Partnerships here at the Center. Uh, we're here and we're also online. So I'd like to introduce to you today our speaker for our speaker series is Dr. Jessalyn Olabinski. <laughs> Jessalyn is a data scientist and epidemiologist. She specializes in answering important healthcare questions through a unique population and policy-based perspective. Her work focuses on complex problems at the healthcare system level, resulting in the optimization of healthcare services and patient outcomes for emergent conditions. She's highly skilled in administrative and big data use, complex modeling techniques, including machine learning and health systems level research. So thank you very much for joining us today for the Center for Health Informatics speaker series. And we'll have this discussion today about improving outcomes, saving costs, and looking at volumes and changes um, through the example of emergency stroke transport. All right, here's Jessalyn. Thank you, Kathy, for that introduction. And I'm really happy to be here today talking to you in the room and to everybody online um, about some of my work. So I've titled this talk, Data-Driven Decision-Making for Acute Stroke. Uh, and we'll talk about how we've managed to do some interesting things with data in stroke transport system. And maybe you'll take away some things here that might be applicable to your own clinical areas. Um, a couple of disclosures. My slide will change. Well, no, there we go. Uh, this work was funded by Alberta Innovates and CIHR throughout my PhD and postdoc. Uh, and then I'm also the part owner of Destiny Health Inc., which is a software company that's spun out of this work. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit today. So when Karen asked me to come and talk um, about this, this was the paper that she wanted me to come talk to you about, which was um, quantifying improved outcomes, cost savings, and hospital volume changes from optimized emergency stroke transport. Uh, the first author here, Daniel Gakbar, is a um, math and stats master's student from the University of Washington that I worked with over a couple of summers uh, and was really fantastic in this work. But before I can get you here, I'm going to take you back in time a little bit. We're going to go back to the future, and this we're going back to 2015, which is when the future of stroke research really started for me. So I'm going to take you back to 2015 and take you through some of my journey to get to uh, some of the really interesting work that Daniel did we can talk about. Um, I'm going to level set everybody here. So this we're all going to talk about acute stroke today. So in case anybody is unfamiliar, um, an ischemic stroke is a blockage uh, in the brain. So that means that anything downstream from that blockage is you know, losing oxygen, losing nutrients, and the brain will start to die. Uh, in the stroke world, we often say that time is brain. And so in a typical large occlusion stroke, uh, the average patient loses about 1.9 million neurons every minute that their brain is oxygen deprived. Um, so that is a massive loss in terms of the patient. So it is really important to treat stroke effectively and very quickly. I'm showing you here kind of the underside of the brain. And when I talk about uh, large vessel occlusions, uh, what I'm talking about here is this boxed area where we have some of the major feeder arteries to the brain. You can imagine if some of those major feeder, artery, feeder arteries are blocked off, a lot of brain could be at risk. So we're talking about the big bad strokes today. Not that any stroke is good, but we're talking specifically about some of these really nasty ones. Um, the standard of care for treating these types of strokes uh, since about the 1990s was Alteplase. Alteplase is a clot busting medication. You can think of it like pouring Drano down a clogged drain. Hopefully it will eat its way through the clot, therefore restoring blood flow to the brain. Um, there's some pros and cons to these treatments. The pros for Alteplase is that it's widely available and easy to administer. It's administered through an IV. Uh, it's a relatively inexpensive medication you know, level setting it to some of the other things that we do in the hospital. Uh, and, you know, an IV medication is fairly easy to administer. Uh, the cons, though, is that it has low efficacy, especially in these big bad clots that we're talking about. 
depending on the location of the clot and how close it is to the beginning of that circle of Willis in your brain, we could be looking at only one to 39% efficacy. Of course, the further into the brain you get, the smaller the clot would have to become. Therefore, maybe you've got a better chance of eating through it. But some of those big, bad clots, it's not going to work very well there. So a really, really exciting time for stroke was in 2015 uh, when a procedure called endovascular therapy was proven to be more effective than multiplace for treating these large strokes. Um, this was done by uh, five RCTs around the world. One of them was actually led here at the UFC by Michael Hill and Matt Goyle's group, which was very cool. Uh, and endovascular therapy uh, is when a catheter is threaded from the femoral artery up into the brain and the offending clot is physically removed. So if we want to go back to the plumbing analogy, you know, this is getting the pipe snake out and removing all the gunk from the clogged sink. Pros to this treatment is that it is super effective up to uh, over 80% efficacy. And I will say every year that registry data comes out, this number just keeps climbing and climbing with improved techniques, improved training, and some improvements in the actual catheter itself. Uh, but the cons here is that we need really specialized equipment and personnel to be able to perform this procedure. Um, this is performed um, under angiography, so you need an angio suite with biplane angiography, so looking at the patient from two views. Um, you need a lot of different personnel and some really highly trained neurointerventional radiologists. So you can imagine this is something that is just not going to be available at all of your community hospitals. We just don't have the equipment or the personnel to support that. So what ends up happening is that we get centralization of treatment and that we're, you know, no stranger to centralized treatment in the healthcare system. And this has happened in stroke. So that means that we do have geographic disparities in access. Um, I'm showing you here a map of Alberta. I hope everybody can see it okay. There are some yellow dots on the map which indicate hospitals which we call stroke centers. And these have um, people that are trained in them to be able to deliver Alteplase, the clot busting medication. But then we just have two centers in Alberta, Foothills Hospital here, and then the UAH in Edmonton that have the equipment and the personnel available to deliver endovascular therapy. So in a situation where every minute counts for a stroke patient, if you are not living in the Calgary or Edmonton area, we have a problem in terms of how to get you access to the right treatment very quickly. Um, and so this all happened right when I was beginning my PhD and the question on everybody's lips was, well, what do we do? How do we transport these patients? Do we bypass smaller hospitals? How do we deal with this scenario? We have a really large rural population in Alberta, but that's not uncommon in other places in the world as well that are dealing with the same problem. So there were two uh, transport options proposed to solve this problem. Uh, we called one the drip and ship option and the other the mothership option. So the drip and ship option, I'm showing you here by the solid line on the screen. And what that means is the patient will be transported to their nearest stroke center where they could receive all to place the clot busting medication. And then they could be transferred to an endovascular center. So that's Foothills or UAH in Alberta, where they could receive endovascular therapy afterwards. These two procedures can be combined. They're often frequently combined, and there's even some thought process out there that perhaps giving clot busting medication first might soften up the clot for easier extraction later, but that's heavily debated currently in the literature. Um, and then we've got the DASH line, which is the direct to mothership option. So in this option, patients are going directly to that endovascular center. That could mean they're bypassing a closer local stroke center. Um, this is going to mean the patient will have delayed access to first-line treatment of place, but they're going to get earlier access to endovascular therapy. So we get this kind of balancing effect of we're delaying any treatment, but providing earlier access to the more efficacious treatment. And in a situation where minutes matter, what's best for the patient? If you want to visualize it in a different way, I've uh, visualized this here in kind of a flow chart where we look at the different steps between, you know, the patient calling 911 and eventually getting their treatment. Um, the top bar shows what the drip and ship method like look, might look like. And we can see, you know, the patient is going to have to have the first medical responder come to them. They're going to be transported to a primary stroke center. They're going to have to get treated, you know, and here's my marker for when they might get their alta place. And then we're going to go through a transfer process where they will eventually get to another hospital, get their endovascular therapy. But on the bottom line, I've kind of depicted what might it look like if they went straight to mothership and we can see they're going to get their 
endovascular therapy earlier, but their pulse therapy was delayed compared to the prior one. Is everybody okay with kind of the problem that we're looking to solve here as I've explained it? Awesome. So that's complicated enough, but there's other things that weigh into this too. Um, the biggest problem is that large vessel occlusion or the big bad strokes cannot be definitively identified in the field. The only way we can definitively identify that someone's having one of these strokes is to have imaging of the brain. Um, and except in the very rare case of a CT ambulance, which we'll talk about at the end of the presentation, this just doesn't happen in the field. Um, sometimes I get the question of, well, why don't we just give Alteplase in the field? They do it for heart attacks all the time, actually. But if the patient is having a hemorrhage in their brain rather than a blockage in their brain, uh, giving a clot busting medication is going to be very good for that patient. So we don't have that option of let's just hope it works. There are some clinical scales that have been developed um, to help people identify patients which might be having an LVO in the field that paramedics can perform. Um, and actually, they're fairly easy to perform and perform fairly well. Um, the one that we use in Alberta is called the LAM score, the Los Angeles Motor Scale. And this is where a paramedic is going to ask people questions like, raise your arms, squeeze my hands, things like this to gauge if they're having any hemiplegia in the body, which might be indicative of one of these big bad strokes. Uh, the LAM scale has about 86% sensitivity, uh, meaning it's not bad at picking up patients who have LVO, but of course we are missing some patients who do have an LVO with this scale. Um, but many patients without a large vessel occlusion will also present with a positive LAMS finding, which makes the positive predictive value of this actually fairly low. The positive predictive value um, of a positive LAM scale is only about 45%, which means the other 55% of patients screening positive on LAMS actually don't have a large vessel occlusion. But obviously there is something going on neurologically that's causing them to have some fairly severe symptoms, which is probably going to require transport somewhere, but does it require the same transport as a large vessel occlusion stroke? Maybe, maybe not. So this further muddies the waters of what do we do with people in the field that maybe are having a stroke. So we started to map out what exactly was going on here. What does this all look like? So I started making this tree diagram of, okay, well, here's my bucket of patients that have a positive screen for LVO in the field. I know that some of them up here do truly have a large vessel occlusion, but up to 55% of them don't. And so then we had to look into the literature to say, well, you know, what do those other 55% of patients present with? Um, and it turns out they present with smaller strokes. Um, which would not be amenable to endovascular therapy because they're so in such like small little arteries in the brain, you just couldn't snake the catheter all the way up to get them. Although that is rapidly, rapidly changing with smaller catheters and lots of fun training. Um, as I mentioned, patients who are having a hemorrhagic stroke or a bleed in the brain, they can also go positive on some of these scales. And then we have patients that are having a, what we call a stroke mimicking condition meaning there is something completely non-stroke going on um, in the body, in the brain, but it is mimicking the symptoms of a stroke. This could be something like a seizure. It could be brain tumor symptoms. Um, often hypoglycemia can give you some interesting symptoms that could be stroke-like. Um, and also uh, different substance use could give you um, symptoms that could look stroke-like. So we also have this whole bucket of individuals that are having you know, a completely stroke mimicking condition, not a stroke at all. So thinking further about that, um, prospectively, this group of patients would be incredibly difficult to study for a couple of different reasons. Uh, it would be incredibly time consuming to be able to prospectively collect data on all of these different types of patients. Uh, it would be very expensive to prospectively collect data on all these different types of patients, especially as we're looking at patients that present in the field. Um, and it likely would require some large multi-center collaboration just to get a you know, large enough sample size to really say that we could do anything with our results. Um, because stroke is not all that common when you think about all the different reasons people call 911. Stroke is a very small bucket. So what we thought was, there's this problem happening. We don't know where to transport patients. We're really at the forefront of what to do here. We don't think we can prospectively study this. 
let's look into the literature and see what we know previously about patients with stroke, about some of these clinical trials of the different therapies, and see if we could model out a relationship before moving into a prospective study. So that's what we attempted to do. So we looked into our literature to find, you know, the patients that have a large vessel occlusion and what happens to them. All these patients that don't have a large vessel occlusion, what happens to them? We found that some of these patients had really time-dependent outcomes, as we talked about, time is brain. So especially with the large vessel occlusion stroke, time is brain, but time is brain still with one of those small strokes as well. We found that some of these patients really had time invariant outcomes. So patients who are having a hemorrhagic stroke uh, tend to do quite poorly regardless of where and when they are treated. And then patients with stroke mimicking conditions, again, tend to have outcomes which are not related to the time in which they are treated. So we have a bucket of patients with time dependency, a bucket of patients without time dependency. We have a bucket of patients where there are two treatment options. Those large vessel occlusion patients might receive alteplase or endovascular therapy. We have another bucket of patients with just one treatment option. Those smaller strokes are only going to be eligible for all place. So it was a lot to put together. Starting with, well, who are these patients that screen positive in the field? Um, some of the best literature uh, coming out of the stroke screening world is coming out of Australia. And so um, we worked with some colleagues, specifically Henry Zhao, on this paper to look at uh, what's going on with patients who screen positive for stroke in the field. Um, and in Melbourne, they did a huge registry study of everybody that called 911 for stroke life symptoms and found that using that LAMB scale, you know, squeeze my hands, lift your arms, people who screened positive for a large vessel occlusion stroke, 45% of them truly did have that large vessel occlusion stroke. About 11% of them had a smaller occlusive stroke, and you're going to see that as NLVO in this presentation. About 34% of them had an intracranial hemorrhage or a bleed type stroke, and then about 9% of them had a stroke mimicking condition. So now we have some numbers to put to our different buckets. As well. And we started thinking about what do we know about the time dependency of outcome and treatment in our patients with large vessel occlusion stroke. We know that patients with large vessel occlusion stroke can receive alteplase, the clot busting medication. They can receive endovascular therapy, um, you know, the pipe snake type procedure. And that as time from stroke onset to treatment elapses, the likelihood that these patients have a good outcome decreases. And what we found from two different uh, meta-analyses one meta-analysis of several trials that looked at alteplase treatment, and another meta-analysis of several trials that looked at endovascular therapy, um, it had been mapped out what the decay in outcomes was over time. So we were able to take that piece of information and learn from it and learn what is our decaying likelihood of good outcomes. Time elapses for alteplase and endovascular treated patients. The same is true for our patients that have a non-large vessel occlusion with alteplase treatment. Again, from meta-analysis data, we were able to look at what is their decay in good outcome over time if they were to receive alteplase. And then again, looking at our patients who were having a hemorrhage or stroke mimic, um, at the time of modeling, we found that these patients were largely non-time dependent although there is very recent, like eight weeks ago, recent data that perhaps there is a time dependency to certain treatments for hemorrhage. Um, so this is going to be some future work of if this bucket of patients truly is time dependent, that will change things. So we took all of that data from different observational studies and meta-analyses, um, and we put it together in a very, very large mathematical model to try to predict what would be the probability that a stroke patient has a good outcome. And that means that they are able to go home and resume their activities of daily living after stroke with minimal intervention, given that they were treated with a certain time from onset to treatment, which of course would be variable based on whether they went the drip and chip or the mothership method, and further variable based on the geography, how far away are they from these different sectors. But if we could model this out, predict outcomes, and then look at a, for a particular piece of geography, if a patient went drip and ship or if a patient went mothership, 
what would be the best predicted option. Does everybody follow me still? So a couple different questions came out of this. Um, it would have been so lovely to find out that there was like a cut and dry option that one transfer method was always better than the other. Um, spoiler, not the case. And then, so that led us into another question of, is this answer sensitive to different things like geography or hospital level workflows? Then we had the really, really tough question of, so we've come up with a model, it predicts outcomes, how do we visualize the results? Um, and I know James, you were at my visualization talk, so James got to see all of the like really, really poor visualizations that I made over several steps to come up with a good visualization. And I'll just show you the good visualizations this time. Mm -hmm. uh, but this was like quite the process for me to figure out how do I visualize this answer? Um, because you can imagine a clinician wanting to know what to do really doesn't want to look at the horrific graphs that I made the first time around. What they want to do is look at a map and say, where am I? And here on the map, where do I go? Um, so this is what spurred us to develop a software to be able to visualize this in any stroke system. So we took our data-driven model, um, we took all of the different inputs that could go into this, like geography, different hospital workflows. I'm sure everybody here is aware that not all hospitals are as efficient as each other. Some hospitals treat patients very quickly in the emergency department. Some hospitals are a little bit slower at treatment. And in a space where minutes matter, that's really important. If a patient is sitting in an ED waiting to be treated where they could be on the road heading to somewhere else to get treated faster, that's important for a patient with stroke. So what we found is that universal bypass was not the answer, but the optimal protocol could be generated and modeled based on everybody's local context. And then we did have to develop the software to visualize this. So this is Alberta. I'll kind of orient you to what's going on in this map. You can see I've got my yellow dots on the map, which show all of the centers where we can deliver um, Alteplase or the clot busting medication. I've got our two blue diamonds on the map, Foothills and UAH that can deliver endovascular therapy. And then the map is color coded into red and green. And I greatly apologize for any red, green, colorblind people in the room. We thought we had a great idea with like a stop and go method. We've since learned. But areas here are red. There's a couple other red areas up here. Red indicates drip and ship was the best predicted option for these patients. So for the areas in red, we're predicting you should head into your local center, get the drip or alteplase, and then be shipped to your endovascular center. Areas in green, so you can see lots of green around foothills, lots of green in the Edmonton area, are places where you should be bypassing your local stroke center and heading straight to mothership, straight to your endovascular therapy. But what we found was that that was one map I showed you, but now I'm showing you another map that looks a little bit more realistic to exactly how fast patients get treated in some of our more rural centers. So you can see the sensitivity of decision-making to a local context. Um, so the first map here uh, showing maybe what looks like an ideal treatment scenario if everybody's treating really fast and efficient. Um, the second map here showing maybe a more realistic scenario where some of our smaller hospitals actually don't treat patients quite as quickly. And you can notice that, you know, we've got red deer in here and camrose, and both of these centers are predicted to be best outcomes for the patient if they are totally bypassed because the patient could be in Calgary or in Edmonton receiving treatment in the same length of time that they would have sat in either of those two emergency rooms. So uh, again, a need for something, you know, dynamic, not static, because we know that these things change, hospital performance fluctuates over time. What was really, really cool for me um, coming out of this is I thought I was going to, um, you know, do a PhD and get a degree and learn some research. Um, but I came up with something that people wanted, which I didn't know was going to happen. Uh, so all of a sudden we had all this inbound interest from other countries and health systems coming to our group to say, well, what would this look like, you know, in my, in my city, in my state, in my province, in my country, et cetera. Um, so we got to do some really, really cool collaborative work with different places around the world. And Karen, this is what I was talking to you a little bit earlier about, but we got to work with lots of health systems uh, across Canada, across the U.S., in Europe, in Australia, uh, to help them figure out what is the right protocol in their local context. 
And then we also got to learn a lot um, through those collaborations of how stroke was treated similarly or differently in other places in the world. And to give you just a fun insight into something that was different that I learned, we worked with a health system in Germany um, who found it more efficient to move doctors rather than move patients. So instead of uh, the patient going a drip and ship method, they call it the drip and drive. So your patient goes to their local center and while they are on their way to their local center, you also send an interventionalist to that center. That obviously works in a very specific healthcare system, which much have the infrastructure available at all of their centers, but not the people. And so they move their people around and have found that to be much more efficient than moving their patients around, which is kind of interesting. That model has also been adopted um, in New York City where physicians can move by subway and ambulances are often gridlocked on the street. So we learned a lot of cool things like that during this project. Um, some other cool things that happened out of this project was that a group in Spain did a randomized controlled trial because they didn't believe us and ended up validating our model. So that was fun. Um, so there's a lot of uh, different opinions out there over whether or not mothership should always be the right answer. Um, and it's not, it is not always the right answer to just send all your patients to the biggest center. Um, those local centers are valuable in many contexts. Um, and then now modeling a system for your local context is actually a part of both the American and the European stroke guidelines that you need to consider these things for your patients. So that all brings us back here which is if you do this and you make optimized transport protocols for your patients, uh, what happens to your costs, your patient outcomes, and your hospital volumes? Because that's the first question that I got every single time that uh, somebody wanted to maybe change their stroke transport protocol was how many more patients are gonna show up to my ED? My ED, my ED is already overcrowded. I don't have room for any more patients. And now you're going to send me a flood of stroke patients. I don't know what to do with them. So we needed to be able to quantify exactly what would happen. And then also, could we predict how many additional excellent outcomes could be attributed to optimize by, um, bypass transport protocols? And what would this look like from a cost avoidance perspective as well? Because stroke is a really expensive disease to treat, especially in the long term. So this is the work that um, Daniel Padarfar, the student at University of Washington, collaborated with us to do. And so he looked at things like the population density in the area that we were studying, stroke incidence rates in the area that we were studying, the typical breakdown of stroke type in the area that we were studying. Uh, different populations have different percentages of ischemic versus hemorrhagic stroke, typically. Um, historical data on EMS use for stroke symptoms. Uh, believe it or not, not everybody that is having, you know, a possibly paralyzing stroke actually calls EMS. Many of them do drive themselves or have their loved one drive them to the hospital, which is never advisable if you think you're having a stroke. It's a public service announcement. <laughs> um, and then also the sensitivity and positive predictive value of different EMS screening tools to come up with a fun formula to estimate in every parcel of geography that we might be looking at how many patients might call 911 with these stroke-like symptoms and end up having that positive field screen for stroke. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean they are having a stroke, but they've got the right symptoms, they have a positive screen. So if we could estimate that for different parcels of geography, we could then attribute each parcel of geography to two different hospitals. Uh, first, their closest local stroke center in the event that the classic stroke protocols used, send them to their closest hospital. Or we could attribute that parcel of geography to our optimized transport best predicted center. And then we could do a comparison to see if there were any differences in patients being transported, you know, say out of zone, uh, and then what outcomes might look like for those patients. Um, if you're interested in reading Daniel's paper, there's like a lot more math in it. I'm just picking out a couple pieces to hopefully not put anybody to sleep. But one thing that I did want to pick out is that um, in case it hasn't occurred already to anybody, uh, as we are thinking about transporting patients further away from their local center, longer transport, delayed time to treatment, that potentially works well for somebody who's having a large vessel occlusion stroke and needs to get to that endovascular therapy. 
that potentially could be harmful for the other patient groups as they are being transported further away from treatment. Um, so we do need to look at that balance. So that's what's going on here in the top part of our formula, looking at differential outcomes for the large vessel occlusion patients, which usually looks positive for optimized transport, but then we do need to consider that there could be a negative differential outcome for the non-large vessel occlusion patients as well. So in this paper, we did uh, a case study with the greater Vancouver area um, because they were a group that was really interested in optimizing their stroke transport protocols, but were also a group that was really concerned about what would happen to their ED volumes. So we use them as a case study. Uh, to orient you to the geography on the screen, you're looking at uh, Vancouver going east to Chilliwack. This is uh, this last center here is Chilliwack. This is only about a 70 minute drive. So if you imagine, you know, 70 minutes outside of Calgary, you're not quite getting to Red Deer and look at all of these hospitals in between. So this is a very different scenario than what we have in Calgary. Um, unsurprisingly, when you have a lot of hospitals really close to these big centers and you might sit in an emergency department when you could be just half an hour away from a bigger center, uh, Given the local context and some of the slower treatment times observed, um, recommended bypassing all of their smaller centers to bring everybody into their two EVT centers in downtown Vancouver. Um, that's a lot. And what I've shown you here, and I hope online, I'm sure you can see it at the back of the room, maybe you can't, but I have numbers in these bubbles. So here's an endovascular center. It's got the number 475 in it. That's 475 additional patients per year. We think that center will see with optimized transport because we're diverting patients away from some of their local centers. Uh, this hospital is uh, more greatly affected, 962 additional patients per year. So at our first hospital here, that's about one to two patients a day in the ED. Here we're looking at about two to three patients a day in the ED. And of course, these are patients that have screened positive for stroke. It doesn't necessarily mean they're patients that are going to be treated for stroke. They could be having other things going on. But that's what the impact looks like for these two hospitals anyway. One to two or two to three extra potential patients a day. And of course, that means that our other centers are seeing fewer patients. Uh, so that's where they're heading into. Looking at that on a bigger scale, um, Annually, in this geography, which has got just over 3 million people, we estimate that there would be about 2,000 suspected large vessel occlusion transports a year. So about 2,000 patients that meet that uh, you know, positive LAMS scale, we think they're having a large stroke. Among those, it's 71% of them that are going to be rooted away from their local closest hospital. So that's fairly significant in terms of rerouting patients. In doing so, the net benefit was, we estimated to be 52 more excellent outcomes. Uh, so of course, not just 52 patients having excellent outcomes, but 52 additional patients having excellent outcomes with this rerouting and earlier access to endovascular therapy. Looking at how resource intensive it is to treat a stroke patient who has a poor outcome, including things like rehab and long-term care stays, um, that's about $3 million in cost avoidance in the first year alone. Um, thinking about any extended stay in rehab or long-term care, you can imagine how that number might grow. Um, and that was based on costs associated with different levels of post-stroke disability. If you like to view this in a different way, we put together this uh, about 14,000 um, diverted transports, 52 net benefit. That's a number needed to transport of 27. So for every 27 patients that you transport in an optimized way, you're getting one additional slant. Positive, yes. Super efficient and practical, not really. Let's think about some of the other things that happen when you maybe take an ambulance out of its home territory, like an ambulance from Chilliwack, a smaller center. If you're gonna send that ambulance, you know, 70 minutes, into Vancouver, and that paramedic is going to sit with a patient perhaps for a while. They're going to have to get back to Chilliwack. Um, you know, are we resource depriving another area for a length of time? Um, that's something definitely to consider. So there is a lot going on in this type of decision making. So the question becomes, well, how could we reduce this number needed to transport? 
Uh, what if the number needed to transport, you know, was three, four, five? Um, maybe that would, you would think, oh, okay, well, now it's worth it to be sending ambulances way outside of their jurisdiction to be improving patient outcomes. The big answer to that is increasing diagnostic capability in the field. If we could be better at field diagnosis, we could be better at identifying patients that really need to be treated in the field and getting them to the right place at the right time. So I'm departing from the paper I was asked to talk about today and talking about some of the cool future things that are happening in stroke to maybe help get this to a better place. So the simplest way to do that would be maybe to have a better screening tool in the field. Um, so I'm showing you here the ACT FAST tool, which was a tool uh, generated in Melbourne, which was shown to have a much higher positive predictive value than some of the tools that are used in other places in the world, including uh, here in Alberta. And also really interestingly, it picked up very few stroke mimics as positive screens here. So thinking about if you could eliminate that stroke mimic category, you are only transporting patients that have some type of stroke that need to go somewhere eventually. So removing that group from your consideration would be really great for optimizing uh, stroke transport protocols. One of the more difficult things about this tool, and this is where uh, I've learned a lot about uh, different ways that hospital systems work internationally, um, to become a paramedic in Australia, that is a full four-year degree program, and that is not the case everywhere in the world. So the paramedics in Australia are highly trained, and to go through some of the steps in this, like trying to look at things like a gaze preference or aphasia, um, really difficult for a paramedic without a high degree of training to do. And you can imagine that some of the rural paramedics that we have in rural Alberta or in other rural areas might not have the degree of training to accurately employ this, which is why we've gone with a very simple tool here in Alberta. And we've got some really fun free hospital technologies. Um, so these are two different free hospital technologies that are in trials right now. Uh, the one on the left is from Forest Devices. It's called AlphaStroke. Um, and it's like a swim cap type device that EEG leads are put onto. Um, so what makes it really interesting from the pre-hospital space is that if you throw the swim cap on the patient, your leads are placed in the appropriate area. So we don't have to train people on where to place EEG leads. Um, and there is some really interesting data that you might be able to use EEG to detect differential um, blood flow and brain activity. And maybe this could help hone in on where there is a large or small stroke. Um, this is currently being trialed uh, in Calgary Metro EMS for feasibility. Um, so just if EMS are able to actually use the software, um, you know, put the swim cap on, use the device. It's not being trialed for outcomes right now, but there's a feasibility trial that's happening here in Calgary Metro. Um, and also we are collaborating with a group out of the Netherlands that's trialing it in the Netherlands as well. Um, but they're actually hoping to get some information out of it in terms of its sensitivity, specificity, and positive predictive value. And they could take that and put it into some of the algorithms we've developed to see how would their stroke transport change if they use this. Because there is an interesting question of, would my stroke transport actually not change that much? And therefore, is it worth investing in this technology? Another more expensive technology, which again, you should really uh, test if it's worth investing in, uh, is this device called the uh, Nova Guide 2 from Nova Signal. Um, it's a TCD device, uh, so transcranial Doppler, uh, which is actually really old ultrasound technology. Um, but what's really interesting is that most people have a temporal window kind of up here and your skull is thinner there and you can actually put a Doppler probe on there and get blood flow readings out of it. So if you could get blood flow readings or a lack of blood flow reading, this might tell you that perhaps there's a stroke going on. Um, this device has some really cool AI guided robotic features so that you might not have to train people to properly find the temporal window, which is actually quite hard to do. So they've got an AI guided robot that does that. And then also some fun algorithms to help uh, produce a probability of all the field. Um, so we're collaborating with uh, both of these groups at a trial in the Netherlands to see how this goes. So stay tuned. And then the most expensive option is, well, why don't we just put a CT scanner in the back of an ambulance, drive it around the city, and when we find a stroke patient, we will then be able to scan them right away and even treat them right in the ambulance because we know what's going on. Super cool idea. You can imagine this is incredibly expensive, maybe not very cost efficient. Um, we do have one of these in Edmonton. 
Um, and it runs on a really cool model where they actually try to rendezvous with an incoming amulet from a very rural area such that it's kind of like they're bringing the primary stroke center to you. Uh, so that's the way that Edmonton is deploying this kind of on a week on week off basis uh, for trialing outcomes. It's pretty interesting. But there are um, lots of very well funded healthcare systems in the US and in Europe that actually have several of these within their city limits, and they do uh, respond just like a normal ambulance to a suspected stroke call. Um, but they're also really, really expensive in terms of staffing. Uh, they are currently staffed by a CT tech, a nurse to deliver Alta Place, and often a stroke fellow. Um, so you can imagine the um, staffing power that goes into that to have uh, those individuals available, you know, on shift anytime to potentially not have a call that this ambulance is useful for. Um, so there's lots of mixed opinions about this all over the world. Um, but what was fun with our data-driven approach is that we could say, well, this is like a roving PSC. Could we just model it? Um, and so we modeled several different scenarios where we thought the stroke ambulance would or would not be useful. Um, again, it's super context specific, um, but we were able to at least put some numbers to it of when this type of technology might be useful. And then to keep going with the what's next before I let you ask any questions, um, stroke treatment is something that's really rapidly evolving. There's a couple of new therapeutics on the market that uh, you know might change the way that we look at this. So this is definitely not a static science. Um, as I mentioned, the assumption that the non-ischemic presentation might not be time dependent is currently being challenged. So that might be something to consider. Um, we haven't done a formal economic analysis of this yet. We've just looked at what could be cost avoidances, but we haven't looked at things like the increased cost of extra transport. Um, so formal economic analysis to come. And then the bigger question is, could a framework like this be applicable to other clinical areas, thinking about things like MI? So that's my foray into some kind of data-driven decision-making in the acute stroke context. Um, I hope it's been interesting, I hope you've learned something. And I, oh, I'd love 15 minutes for questions. So I'd be happy to have any discussion. There are any questions yet? Question? Elliot, oh, Elliot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. um, so your map of Alberta mm -hmm. had some green at the very north above some red. So I was wondering what- Oh, good eye. There. Yeah. Um, so Alberta is massive, as we know. So these places up here that are green all the way up here, this is far enough away from, this is Fort McMurray. This is far enough away from Fort McMurray that a patient um, going from here to here would become ineligible for all the place treatment based on time. And that's something I didn't really discuss in the uh, presentation, but um, the thrombolytic treatment is only given within four and a half hours of stroke onset because um, there is a risk benefit to putting a uh, blood thinner in a person. Um, and so patients up here actually physically would not be able to get here and treat it in under four and a half hours. So there is no point in stopping. But they could still get the EBP. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, again, this is a very rapidly changing landscape. Um, EVT treatment was initially approved in an eight hour time window. It's been bumped to a 12 hour time window. We now have patients being treated up to 24 hours and some patients being treated beyond 24 hours um, using um, kind of MRI guided imaging to show that there is eligible brain left. Um, there's also some work uh, in Europe on patients using MRI guided decision making for maybe treating later than four and a half hours with Alteplase. Um, but that one is a little bit more of a say hard and fast rule in most places that we don't treat beyond four and a half hours because um, there is a risk to actually um, causing hemorrhage if you are to reperfuse already um, in unsalvageable infarcted brain. So what do those outcomes look like then for people who have to travel so far to get EBT? Not great. Um, so when we talk about um, these like really large occlusive strokes, um, if treated, and if treated within a reasonable time window, these are patients that can fully recover. Um, but for patients that are getting treated later in the time window, um, like the probability of recovery could be less than 30%, even less than 20% if you're getting into some of the really late windows. 
Um, so there is, um, and this is somewhere I didn't go on this topic, but there is also, you know, resource use and ethical debate as well over um, some pretty serious resource for what might be a futile treatment, but that's a, um, that's a tough, tough decision making conversation. Great talk, by the way. Um, just a question, does Alberta use any sort of AI powered triage software for drug testing? Um, no, so we have, um, what happens in Alberta is patients are, um, if they're seen in the field uh, with EMS, they go through the LAM scale. And so that's a fairly easy, you know, raise your arms, squeeze my hands kind of thing. If they do screen positive on the LAM scale, uh, what happens is a paramedic phones into rapid and then gets connected with the neurologist wherever locally to them. Um, a neurologist at a comprehensive center, so a neurologist from Calgary Edmonton, um, and also a transport physician who can advise on transport times to, from, and between, and also maybe if we should get a helicopter involved. Um, those folks will get on the phone and make a decision. Um, our tool is one of the tools that they use um, to help make that decision. So this is a data point that they can look at. Um, but of course, there are many other clinical data points you might want to look at as well. So sometimes the neurologist even gets on video call and you know gets to see the patient a little bit. Uh, but we don't use any other special AI tools in the field. Lots of AI in the hospital, though, especially for um, image post-processing. And if you are applying your models and technology to other locations like other countries, um, you, you must need a minimum data set to do so uh, that is equivalent to what you're, you modeled it on in Canada? Um, so looking at what the model is based on, the model is really biologically based. So it's based on um, biological decay and clinical outcomes based on treatment. But what the system needs to know in order to employ our models, they need to know uh, where their hospitals are and what treatments their hospitals provide. That seems obvious, but sometimes that's a question that's actually hard to answer in a healthcare system. And the system also needs to know um, the median treatment times that they have for their patients. So um, one of the kind of beautiful things about a model like this is that it's population-based. So we don't need all of the individual patient data uh, to come into the software, but we do need things like median treatment time to come into the software. Is there any reason why you do only Vancouver or not other cities like Toronto or Vancouver? Uh, so Vancouver was used as the case study in the particular paper that we did because it was a neurologist from Vancouver that was really interested in implementing bypass and understanding uh, what the ramifications would be on their system. So we used them as a case study in the paper. Um, but done lots of work in other stroke systems, and they're all unique, um, which again, there is no one size fits all solution to stroke transport. Um, so they all have unique intricacies of what they look like in terms of drip and ship or mothership transport, and in terms of the impact of how many patients uh, you are rerouting in a place like Vancouver, uh, that greater Vancouver area, more than 3 million in population. And you can see we're rerouting about 1,400 patients a year. Uh, if you run the same thing in Alberta with a much smaller population and also just a different layout of our stroke system, um, I don't know if anybody has noticed that, you know, around Calgary, there's not a lot for stroke except for foothills. Like we don't even treat stroke at, you know, Rocky View PLC or South. Um, so there's less rerouting of patients that would happen here because we are already rooting to Calgary. Um, so it would be far fewer than 1,400 patients a year rerouted in Alberta for population density reasons and just different setups. So it's totally unique based on system, which is one of the things I think is pretty cool. Which tool you use for this data analytics? It's a custom built software that we used. Getting to this in the future study around economic viability. So the the question was. 
what's the opportunity cost in terms of you know putting more resource um, into stroke or stroke transport and how might that affect other areas? So that's a great question. Um, answer in kind of two ways. One is that stroke is a really interesting disease in that um, the most efficient treatment is also the most cost effective treatment. And that is not always the case in many healthcare um, spaces. So uh, treating stroke is yes, um, time intensive, resource intensive. However, the consequence of not treating stroke patients um, is not often death, uh, which is actually to be crude, like a very cheap outcome. Um, but the consequence of not treating stroke is that patients often end up in long-term care for a long time and that's incredibly resource utilized uh, intensive. So treating stroke first is super cost effective, which is great. However, there's an opportunity cost in terms of rerouting services, which is what I'm most concerned about in the future, um, especially as we think about routing an ambulance away from a rural area that might only have you know, a handful or less than five ambulance crews on service at any given time. So if you're taking you know, 20 to 25% of their resource away for what could be a very lengthy period of time, I think that's a huge cost um, to that community. So that's something that definitely needs to be considered. Um, and then also, I think it's incredibly important um, from an ED standpoint to make sure that should I optimize transport protocol come into place that's going to cause volume change, that all the stakeholders are aware of that. We're aware that we've made a system level decision to increase the potential stroke patients in your emergency department and what are the pathways you're going to go through to fill that. And then from the other side, if we are making a system level decision to decrease the number of stroke patients at certain hospitals, uh, that doesn't mean that they will never see a stroke patient. So what is the consequence of seeing something very severe, but not very often in terms of pe keeping people's skills up to be able to appropriately treat? So um, it's a huge, complicated web of decision making. Um, so the new sort of method to determine things they developed in Australia, you said had a lot better PPD. Um, how is it doing the sensitivity though? Did they tank the sensitivity or is it still good? No, it's really good. They've done a really good job in developing their act fast um, scale. So it still has really high sensitivity. Um, it's the PPV is in the high 60s range, so it's still not great, but it's much better than the mid 40s range that we see in some of these other screening tools. Um, so that's fairly clinically significant in my mind, um, but I don't know how much higher of a PPV you're going to get with just a clinical symptoms type tool. Um, even the screen that uh, physicians go through, uh, it's called the NIH stroke scale when someone arrives at hospital and it's got like 38 different questions in it. And even going through all of that um, still doesn't have a great PPV. And that's what many of these, um, <clears throat> I'll say smaller tools are trying to mimic, you know, what are the most important items in the NIH scale? Can we get reasonably high PPV with just doing uh, some items that we think um, paramedics can reliably perform in the field? I think the only way you're gonna get really good PPV is with some kind of technology, um, but whether or not we'll get great technology in the field, who knows? I think that's kind of an exciting time for stroke there. And then also um, what's the cost effectiveness of putting these technologies in the field if they don't perform that much better than a clinical scale. So you spoke about uh, like those mobile- uh, Stroke units, yeah. Campus. So uh, like, I don't know, but my understanding was that alcohol needs to be administered in the hospital because of the side effects that might happen. So how safe are those in terms of like administering uh, these medications? Yeah. Does that have been giving such medication can cause some of the So the question was in terms of mobile stroke units, uh, being able to deliver alteplase in the field, is that safe to do so? Um, so yes, it has been found safe to do in the field. Um, it, there's several um, mobile stroke units across the world and they've uh, come together in what's called the best MSU consortium um, to pool all their data. So it has been found safe in the field, but it's safe in the field because you can do a CT scan to rule out hemorrhage at the outset. 
uh, in terms of delivery in the field is delivered via IV. And uh, we do require in Alberta that is a nurse uh, at minimum that is delivering. So we do staff um, ACE with both nursing and stroke fellows. Uh, this is not something in Alberta anyways that paramedics can deliver in the field, um, but in other locations, that's actually different. Um, and then the also the other idea with a mobile stroke unit is that they're not that far away from a hospital, right? So they're deployed in an urban area, um, with the exception of Edmonton, where they rendezvous with an incoming ambulance. Um, but you can imagine they're not that far away from the hospital. So as soon as they're treated, they're on the road back to a hospital, they might be at a hospital with an intensive care unit available to them in minutes. Okay. Thank you very much, Jessalyn. This is wonderful. Yes. Thanks everybody for Chiming in online. Oh, I didn't even look at the questions online I missed. No. Yeah. 